Good morning, everyone. Um, so just, uh, we're starting a new section today. I thought I'd just uh, point out just a few more things from the last example that are interesting to just think about going ahead yourself when you're looking at these problems. So one of the concerns we had yesterday, remember we were putting up that comparison on the board where we were comparing cross current to counter current. And essentially we had that last piece of there over there on the far side of the board showed that a cross current system had n equals two stages and with our counter current we had n equals six stages. Okay. You'll also remember then that the solvent usage S for this cross current system was 50 kilograms plus 50. We had 50 kilograms in the first stage and then another 50 kilograms coming in the second stage. And then over here in the second, uh, sorry, in the counter current example we had S um, was 28 kilograms per hour coming in. One discussion we, we didn't have yesterday is just a little bit about what happens when you vary that S. Remember as the engineer you have control over how much solvent you feed to those cross current stages but you also have the flexibility to adjust S in the counter current stage. Okay. So I'd like you to take a minute here and think, here's the diagram we ended up with yesterday. Let me uh, maybe just declutter it a little bit and go back to something a little simpler. So if we take that system as is, that was the system with 28 kilograms per hour of solvent. What's going to change on this diagram if you use more solvent? This is sort of like one of these IQ tests. We have to see multiple lines move and change. And what's going to happen on this diagram as S goes higher? Okay, if you can answer that question, you understand this entire topic of liquid-liquid extraction. Okay, so let's answer this. What happens, what's going to change on this diagram if S is greater? I use, put more solvents into the system. Yep. Uh, your M position is going to move up for the solvent, so it's going to move left. Okay, so everyone's clear from the lever rule that M is going to move towards S. Okay, so that's the first mental step that happens. F stays in the same location, only M shifts. Rn also stays in the same location, right? We still want to achieve that outlet concentration in the raffinate. So Rn is fixed. So what else changes then? The number of stages goes, decreases. Okay? So fewer stages are required. Neil, do you want to?
Okay, so E1 moves. What happens to the concentration of your extract then? Okay, so the concentration of extract of A, the solute, drops. Okay, so there's the, there's the key insight that you've not really achieved something for nothing. You've got fewer stages, less capital expenses, but something's got to give. You get lower extract concentration. Remember we said yesterday we actually would like higher extract concentrations. But e, X E1 drops. Okay? So less solvent, the opposite happens. So there's less solvent. This point M shifts towards F. As that happens, Rn stays in the same place. So I now draw a steeper line. E1 concentration increases, but I need more stages required. Okay, so you, you spend less money on solvent, but you need more stages. If you do that, however, you get an XE1A goes up. Okay, so you get a, a, a more concentrated extract. Okay, so again, always we see this trade-off in engineering. You're going to either be trading off operating costs versus capital costs. Um, and here's a, here's a classic example of that. Okay. Now, there is also a point where you can shift these lines, where you can add so much solvent that point M moves closer and closer. What happens as solvent moves towards here? We'll eventually reach a point where this line E1 passing through F and P doesn't actually intersect. You actually don't get an operating point. Okay, so there's a some point where those two lines become parallel and they, they don't actually cross over each other. And that's our maximum solvent flow rate that's, that we can really use in the system. Now, not that you'd practically go operate at that point, but just to be mindful that there is an upper bound on how much solvent you'd want to add. Okay. So what this indicates here for us is that if you've got a fixed system, because this is going to be the more likely instance in your, in your career, is that you come to a company where there's already a system. So you don't get to change N. And it, what happens is if you're not getting the, solvent re, uh, the solute recovery that you need, um, pretty much your only other degree of freedom you have is then to vary your solvent flow rate. Okay, so once N is fixed, your only flexibility in the system is to vary solvent flow in order to adjust the extract concentration. Okay. So I just wanted to, um, to emphasize that point. There's also another slide here I didn't show last time, and that is if you take this triangular diagram for the six stages, you can go plot the concentration profile of the solute through the system. Okay. So what we see there is that um, extract leaving leaves at 48%, 40, 47%. And we, as we go counter current, um, we get the sort of extract profile. We also get our raffinate profile. So coming in my system, uh, raffinate concentration is first high. And then I, I, at each subsequent stage, I'm removing solute from the raffinate stage. And what's happening is I'm transferring that solute over to the extract phase. So that's happening in counter current there. So just pay attention to the label number and try and generate this plot on your own if you haven't already. Okay. If, if you did that like, on a computer, would you see that in fraction points? Is that a common thing? Uh, no, this is just uh, this is a, a feature of where this line is. So these extract concentrations are just E1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Where they are is a function of how, what the curvature of this arc looks like and what the tie lines look like. Is it will be common thing It will be different for every system, yeah. We can't say. Okay, so uh, just, uh, just a visual indication of the counter current. What you can't get, though, is for these lines to cross. 
Okay, so then the last few slides are um, just some empty triangular diagrams for you to practice with for two systems um, that we've used here in class. And also I have at the front a whole bunch of spare copies. So if you'd like to come pick up a printout of some spares here at the front, that's, that's free. The last uh, or two final things I wanted to just quickly um, draw your attention to is that we don't always have to have a triangular diagram. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Um, it is that point over there is just the point where these tie lines will eventually come together and at that point. So the plate point is just the point where if you take a mixture the, and let it settle into its two phases, what's the composition of the lighter phase and the composition of the heavier phase? So the plate point is the point where the composition of the two phases separating are identical. It's just a theoretical construct, yeah. Okay, so this arc that we're given here, as well as the tie lines, one of the questions that often comes up is where, where does that come from, right? And do you just crack open a book and find all possible combinations of solvents and solutes and carriers? Well, that does exist. There are si such textbooks for common systems, but if you're encountering a system that you don't have the data for, it's not that you're stuck. It's that you have to construct that yourself. Okay, and so uh, there was this, um, this question from an assignment last year, looked at that idea, and what I uh, did was uh, give the empty ternary diagram, so there's an empty triangular diagram that you can go download, and you can go build up that arc yourself. Well, let's see how we do that. And if you needed to do this in practice for yourself, you would take your three species of known composition, okay, so create mixtures of known compositions, and you shake them up, allow them to come to equilibrium, and then you go measure the compositions of the two phases. So here, just let's read the first line together. So those six numbers, um, so this is in percentage. So you've taken a mixture, and when you once settled, the aqueous phase has 1.2% IPE, 98% water, 0.7% acetic acid. Okay. And then the organic phase that's in equilibrium with this aqueous phase. So this is in equilibrium, but it's the, diff the other phase is 99.5.5 and 0%. Okay? Those two points are on a tie line connecting to each other. So you can go find this point on the triangular diagram. You can go find that other point on the triangular diagram and connect them with a tie line. And you repeat that for the second, third, fourth, and all of those points. So that's how you construct the tie lines and then you interpolate the arc yourself. Okay. So it's, it's totally um, possible to generate one of those diagrams for any system that you will encounter in the future. So if you're coming up in your future career and you have to design a separator, um, it's possible to find that equilibrium data and generate it yourself. Okay. So, um, so that's a, an example that um, I will post for you to work through. Um, this is not going to be on the next assignment. I'll have a similar question, but I'll post this one for you to try out anyway as practice. And the solution is actually a YouTube video that someone has worked out. And you can go see how they take the, the empty ternary diagram and build it up and then solve the problem of finding the number of stages and calculating the exit, raffinate flows and extract flows. Okay, so I'll, I'll post that to the course website for, for you. The Final thing to just cover in this topic is the idea of a bit of safety. Um, so actually, there is this uh, slide there on the parallel lines if you want to go read that. We've discussed that. But the idea of safety is, um, is very critical when it comes to liquid-liquid extraction. There's a number of conference papers, and I was fortunate enough uh, that my dad works in this industry, and uh, his colleague uh, let me use this paper and post it for you that solvent extraction can result in some dangerous operation. It's, you're talking about material that's got high flash points. Even static electricity um, can set off sparks and create, um, create dangerous fires. 
And what often happens is that these vapors of the solvent are heavy, so they collect in basins, they collect in basements of, of, um, of a plant or in low-lying areas and can uh, cause issues there if it's not well ventilated. Um, even fast liquid flow in pipes can build up static electricity in the, in the pipe and cause, cause issues. So the idea is not to use uh, plastic or rubber piping to transport your solvent um, and have your piping insulated and grounded. Um, so, so there's some, some ideas here, just some, some points of safety to consider for, for you in the future. Okay, so any questions on this topic? solvent extraction. We've seen a number of case studies, a bit of theory. Um, nothing at that point. So there's one final point to come back to that I want to emphasize how this material doesn't just apply to liquid-liquid extraction. What we don't have time for in this course is to look at hundreds of separators. But what we do very well and very intentionally is pick separation units that are representative of a variety of other common separators. And the idea is then that you're able to go apply this knowledge you've learned to other areas. So I want to recap, just as a final point, this idea of two streams in and two streams out. Recall we had our feed, we had our solvent flow, we had our extract, and we had our raffinate. And in about two, three classes ago, I had put up here on the board 13 equations in 15 variables. Okay. I never really spoke about where the other two equations came from that you could use to solve that system. The other two equations are, in fact, not equations per se that you could write down on paper, although you absolutely could find equations for them if you wanted a mathematical representation. But equation 14 is your tie line that connects E and R. Okay. So if you found the mathematical equation for that tie line, that would be your um, one additional equation, and then equation 15 was your lever rule to calculate the E1 mass flow and the R1 mass flow. Okay, so the lever rule for, um, for R and E. Okay, so if I was, had a mathematical representation of that triangular diagram, um, which systems, there are computerized systems that have this ternary diagrams built in and encoded as numeric form, they will then use those as those additional equations. Okay. So why, why am I emphasizing this? Well, here's, here's the concept that I want you to take. You're in final year in many cases of you. Um, so you're able to be at the point in your development of engineering knowledge that you can go learn something in one area and apply it to the other without being explicitly taught. At least that's, um, that's something we hope you are able to develop that skill. So I'm not going to teach you leaching, okay? but leaching is exactly the same process. You contact a fluid with typically a solid phase, okay? and that material from the solid phase leaches out into the fluid phase, and you've got two streams leaving again. Okay, so in fact, I'll show you an example coming up in the next chap in the next section of leaching. But you can set up the 13 equations for that, and you'll just use the mass transfer equations for leaching as your equation 14 and 15. Okay, so remember these 13 equations we derived, these were just mass balances and volume balances. Okay. So if you were applying this to leaching, you would be able to write those simple equations down yourself. You're ex experts at that after second year courses. But then you would just go look up the relevant mass transfer equations for leaching. 
if you're dealing with flotation, similar idea where you're contacting a fluid, sorry, you're contacting a solid phase with liquid and air bubbles, and you're separating it out into two streams leaving your flotation cell. Again, mass balances and volume balances could be set up, and your last few equations would be related to the kinetics of flotation cells. So flotation cells are often modeled as first order reactions in a CSTR, even though there isn't a reaction occurring. We can model the, the rate at which material attaches to the bubbles and floats up as a first order reaction. So again there, your last few equations come from the theory of the unit operation that you're dealing with. Okay? So this idea of, the, of this single stage operation can easily be extended to other units. Where the interesting engineering comes is now if you have a second stage. So this E is your extract, R is your raffinate. I can go add a second stage onto this unit and develop another 13 equations for that second stage and build up a larger and larger unit, okay? And then so start to solve that in something a little bit more sophisticated than um, Excel. You'd have to probably start moving to um, using a software modeling tool like Ample or GAMS or MATLAB or other tools that will work for that. Okay, so the idea is very much extendable to other units. And I just wanted to emphasize that we don't teach everything in this course, but we do teach you, I've chosen unit operations that are representative and um, can be extended easily. So in your career in the future, don't be surprised if you have to model a leaching system and when you start looking at the, at the equations, you start to see a lot of familiarity with other units.